Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Well, y'all are singing for their mothers today, I tell you. You sound so good and know, know what good singing means, right? I get an extra 15 minutes on my sermon at the end to add on. That's what you, you sing good, that means you want to hear more preaching. Amen. All right, we're going to try to be timely. Uh, I really do believe and understand uh, the nature of our culture and world that we live in today. We don't sit still for those things that are good and just for too long. Uh, but hopefully we'll make enough good points that we will encourage you in your walk of faith and encourage you uh, to consider those things that are well-pleasing and acceptable to God. We're going to continue our series of lessons on natural evangelism because this year Brookfield is endeavoring to be more evangelistic. And we've had several sermons that have prepared us for the field, the field that uh, Peyton just read, in, uh, not Peyton, but Isaiah read into your hearing about uh, the, the laborers are few, the harvest is plentiful. That's our text this morning. And so we want to make sure that we are going out and doing those things that uh, we need to do. We have to get prepared to do that. Yeah. And then we've had several lessons that helped us as far as being in the field. Once we're in the field, the work that needs to be done when we're in the field. And today's lesson will begin a few series, a few uh, couple of lessons that basically encourage me. Because once you're out there in the field, once you're doing the work, sometimes we can get discouraged, amen? amen. So we're going to need some encouragement where that is concerned. And all of this we can find in the Bible. Now next week, uh, Tal is going to be with us for one more Sunday. He's going to be gone for six Sundays. So he's going to deliver our morning message next week before he leaves. And that encouraging message will be about not giving up. Right. And then, Lord willing, you need to come back and hear Brother Palmore that evening. He's going to bring us another lesson in our series of lessons that talk about Jesus being the way. And that's going to be an awesome Amen. day. Amen? Amen? All right. Let's get right to it, shall we? Let me just, for emphasis sake, this is my jumping off and getting into the message. I'll begin with Matthew chapter 9 and starting with verse number 35. There the Bible says that Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. When he saw the crowds, now Jesus saw the crowds, he had what? Compassion. He had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, after he was moved in, in compassion for his lost sheep, he says, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Amen. Amen. So these last three stages of natural evangelism leads us to this stage of encouragement. We've been prepared. We have entered into the field. And brothers and sisters in Christ, those of you who labor alongside with this preacher here, here in Brookfield, all of this needs to have a natural outworking as well. All of these lessons, all of this knowledge, all of this teaching and this encouragement needs to land us somewhere. We need to be able to take that which the Lord says and put it into practice. This is not about just coming to hear great sermons. This is about coming to be equipped to go out and work in the field. And so at some point later this year, we need to consider something along the lines of a gospel meeting, an open house, a workshop, a seminar, something where we can put those things that we have learned into effect and become that light that is set up upon a hill and we need to start praying now for workers for his harvest i like that uh, matthew put his harvest in there because there's something that, that we need to understand god has been busy on his side of the equation god has made himself apparent 
to those people in the world where all is necessary now is for someone to come along and to give them the good news. You see, God has been doing a work outside of you and I that has made the harvest white, that has made the harvest and prepared it for harvesting. You know, we think everything is up to us, but it isn't. Our job is to sow that seed, and our job is to go out and to preach and live this gospel. Now let's start this lesson off by talking about the things that Jesus asked us to pray for. Now would you agree with me that Jesus asked you to pray for something that's something that you and I should pray for? Yeah. Yeah. When was the last time that we prayed for more laborers in the harvest? Right. Could it be that we're a little afraid that if we pray for laborers in the harvest that we're going to be first on the list? that we're going to be the ones that he sends out. It's the same thing that people say, you know, there's no God because there's evil in the world. If God is all powerful, why doesn't he get rid of evil? People don't even don't understand what they're saying. If God's going to get rid of evil, he might start with you. Right? <laughs> if he's going to get rid of evil. So if we're praying for laborers in the harvest, understand that you need to be at the top of that list. God has been at work and the harvest is ready, it's ripe, and it's time for picking. We said this morning in Sunday school, it's, 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 if you need to go back and listen to the recording, there were some great questions and, and responses. Tony did a really good job this morning, along following up with Tal and our book of Joshua and the Lamb before the kingdom. But the, the world has is running out of excuses well, on, on the idea that there is no God. The more we learn, the more science tells us the more things that are happening, we're coming to a very strong understanding as a society, even though people won't look at it, that there is a God. Amen. And you and I uh, have this impression that Christianity is losing. Matter of fact, articles are coming out already starting where, you know, has, Christi has Christianity lost? Mm -hmm. it, it, has, has Christianity seen its best days? It has, is, will Christianity be wiped off the face of the earth? That's because that's what the world wants us to believe. Saints, now's the time for us to move forward, not to cow down, not to back up, but to move forward because science and knowledge and God himself are on our side. And if God is for us, who can be against, who can be against us? Right. But yet, the harvest is plentiful. But the laborers are few. Don't be tricked by the world any longer. Understand that we can move forward and be successful in a way that our Creator and our Savior will be very proud of us. What did Jesus ask us to pray for? Pray for laborers. The church needs laborers. The church needs people to pick up and find themselves something to do. But for the cause of Christ is concerned. And, and, and I love Glenn Rodriguez because Glenn didn't wait for a committee to be established to give him a territory to go out and to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Right. Amen. Amen. You don't need somebody to uh, have a committee and then sign off on and tell you what to do. We know what needs to be done. That's right. Amen. And we just need to start getting out there and start being about getting it done. And it needs to start in your world and in your corner. It needs to start with your family and your friends. It needs to start with your co-workers and your associates. It needs to start in your neighborhood and in your corner of the world because that's where God put you to do his will. Amen. Amen. We ought to understand that we are called to bring the good news to this world. You and I are the ones that are sent now, how many of you are on a job where there's some lazy workers? <laughs> you know, you look around and, and there are people like some of y'all waving your hands frantically. You know, you know, you know those people, right? They they on the clock, but they're not on the job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they're, they're getting paid, but they're not doing anything. And 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 then the people like that have made an art form out of doing nothing. Amen. They have a task to do, but they have figured out how to make it look like they're doing the task so that they will keep their job. They want to learn how, learn how to do just enough to get by. No 
Don't let that be your Christianity. Don't let it look like, you know, you're doing just enough to get by. We're on the clock, church. Let's just do the work. Because the reward is plentiful. The reward is is is, is well getting paid. Now, they just signed our contract at the CTA. Lord have mercy. So Brother Johnson got a raise coming up. Right. Feeling pretty good about that. It's been about five years since we had one, but it, it, it's on the way. Feeling pretty good about that. But you know what? I, I, I'm not ashamed of my raise because I've worked for my raise. Right. Amen. I've done what is required of me, and I'm happy I'm going to get a raise. All right? And you and I need to make sure that we work for the Lord as well because the, the where the, the harvest is concerned, the laborers are few. And, and I believe it's not because there's not enough of us to go around. Right. Now, surely we are in the minority, but God has always operated in the minority. Yes. Yes. Nothing God has ever done throughout the history of time happened because there were more of us than there were of them. Right. So there's always going to be less of us than there are of our objectives. But what is happening today is that there are too many of us in the minority that have become a super minority, almost non-existent, that is causing and crippling churches all over the world and this country and this state and, and, and close to us because people just refuse to put their hand to the plow, right. finding something to do in this great harvest that God himself has prepared in advance of us. Amen. The Bible says in Romans chapter 10, verses 14 and 15, how then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? So there are most people in the world have not believed in God. Say amen if you understand. Amen. We know that most of the world does not believe in God. Well, the Bible says, how are they going to call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him whom they have never believed? Heard. Right. Come on, church. That's important now because God's plan of salvation begins with what? Hearing. hearing. So if it begins with hearing, then guess what? Non believers have to hear. They got to hear. And what are they going to do? Hear a voice from heaven? No. no, God's not operating that way anymore. God's mouthpiece is right there on your face. Amen. And He wants you to use it. So that the unbelievers of this world will come into belief of him. The Bible goes on to say, and how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. Now this was always God's plan of salvation. To put you and I to work in his harvest. Because the prophet Isaiah, way before the New Testament came into existence, had this to say in chapter 52 and verse 7. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who publishes peace, who brings good news of happiness, who publishes salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. Yes. It has always been God's plan. To use his people to bring more of his creation into his safekeeping place, the church of Christ, which exists here on earth to this present day. Amen? Amen. So let's take a brief look then at what the work is of the laborers. Yes. I do not have an exhaustive list, but I do have an encouraging list yes. of work that you and I need to be about doing. Amen. So let's talk about the work of the laborers. Now, whenever there is work for a laborer, we need to understand that work has a goal. Work has a goal. Say that with me, church. Work has a goal. So when we are put to work, God has a goal where our work is concerned. It's not your goal. It's his goal. Matthew said it's his harvest. So he has a goal for his harvest, but he wants us to pray that more laborers, more workers would go into that harvest and achieve whose goal? His goal, right? Now, that goal, when we are faithful to it, when it is favorably responded to, brings about 
believe and obedience. That's goal number one. There's two goals that God has. The second one you might be a little uh, challenged with, but the first one is, is that we go out like we've already read, we preach the good news, and then people believe in him in which they've not believed beforehand, right? And that belief brings about obedience. That's the first goal. God has required that you and I go out and preach the good news. People hear that good news and they obey what's required of them. Is that all right? Amen. That's the first goal. Now, the second goal happens when the good news is responded to negatively. So the first goal is a positive response. What happens? The second goal is a negative response. Now, when the good news is preached and a negative response happens, two things happen. Opposition That's right. and disobedience. Yep. Opposition and disobedience. So when you go out and you share the good news and people aren't jumping to jump into this baptismal pool, you still could have achieved the goal. All right. Amen? All right. yeah. You see, the word of God cuts coming and going. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it separates. It cuts you in and it cuts you out. That's right. And some people have to have a contrast to understand exactly where they're standing. And you know what the churches of Christ are starting to do? They're starting to diminish the contrast. They're starting to make it look like you're all right. God loves everyone. God doesn't judge nobody. There is no hell. Just keep living how you're living. And so what we're doing is we're not being faithful to one of the goals. One of the goals is to put people in an understanding of the contrast that they're in. Why? Because they're in danger. Amen. That's what happened to the prodigal son. He he thought he, you know, he was all that in a bag of chips. Give me my inheritance. I'll go out and live and have a good time. I can do better with that money than you are. That money could serve me better than it's serving you, Father. And, and, and I'm in your house. But then he went out and lived and he saw the contrast. He saw the contrast of how he was living and how his father was living. And he understood. It's like, look, I got to get away from here. I'm going to go back to my father. I'll just be a servant there. I'll still be living better. But what had to happen first? He had to have some opposition and some disobedience to his father. And that allowed him to see the contrast. So when you and I are not faithful to God's word and we preach with addition and preach with subtraction, and we preach to scratch itching ears. We don't allow people the contrast of error and truth. And then they can labor with the false understanding, well, then I'm okay. Then I'm all right. Then people will ask you some tough questions, won't they? Yeah. So you mean to tell me that my parents are going to hell? Or do you mean to tell me that if I don't do this, that I won't be saved? Do you mean to tell me that a loving God would allow this to happen in the world? They're asking some tough questions because they, in their hearts, they understand there is a contrast between good and evil, yeah. between obedience and disobedience, between salvation and human salvation. Men understand it. And you and I have always been. Matter of fact, Brother Akers has known me since I've been baptized. And when I first started preaching, his first advice to me was, he'll tell you to this day, he said, Brother, always paint the difference. Paint the difference. All right. Let people know the truth. It's up to them to decide. That's right. And you can still be faithful to one of two of God's two goals. Yes. Belief and obedience or opposition and and disobedience. And then it's up to the individual to make his uh, decision. One of the uh, job descriptions we have is to proclaim the good news. In Acts chapter 8 and verse number 12, the Bible talks about Philip. Their scripture says, but when they believed Philip as he preached what? Good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were what? Baptized. They believe and they obey. You see, because that's one of the goals. See, preaching is not just about hearing a good lesson. It's not about making you feel good. It's not, you know, having you, you know, cry because of how beautiful Brother Johnson preaches. <laughs> that's not what it's all about. 
It's about you being baptized for the remission of your sins. It's about you being added to the Lord's body. It's about you making your calling and election sure. That's what it's about. When Philip was done preaching, they were baptized. Why? That's one of the Lord's goals. Obedience and belief. And both men and women were baptized. Can you say amen if you understand? Amen. That's our goal, church. When we preach, we're not trying to make friends. No. We're not trying to influence people. We try to get them to believe and obey. Believe and obey. Say it with me, church. Believe and obey. That's our goal. That's what we, that's the positive response to our goal. But we don't, more times than not, we will not get the positive response, we get the negative response. And the negative response that you'll get more than the positive is opposition. So that while you're trying to give that good news, guess what you're going to get? Opposition. And if you get opposition, guess what's not going to happen? Obedience. They're not going to obey. No. But you as a good, faithful steward of God's word, make sure you paint the contrast. Make sure you have painted the difference. Now, we ought to equip ourselves to be persuasive. Make no mistake about it. Be persuasive in helping people turn to God. Now, the, the number one tool that you use for persuasion is what? God's Word. God's Word. Thank you, Gina. Gina's not afraid. <laughs> we use the Bible. Okay? There are other things that can be used, but the Bible is our number one tool. You spend all your effort first in becoming familiar with that Bible. So that it may not be what people want to hear, but it will be what thus says the Lord. Amen? Amen. And then when we preach what thus says the Lord, we're being faithful to God's two goals where the harvest is concerned. Amen. That is calling people to turn to God. So our, our first job description is to proclaim the good news. Our second job description is calling people to turn to God. 2 Corinthians 5, 19 through 20 teaches this. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to who? Us. To us. That's you and I, entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are what? Ambassadors, Ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. Right. We implore you on behalf of Christ be reconciled to God. That's what he wants us to do. He wants us to implore people to be reconciled to God. But Brother Joshua, what if they don't believe in God? Paint the difference. What if they don't believe in the Bible? Paint the difference. What if they don't want to hear what I'm saying? Paint the difference. And I'm not asking you to go out and to debate with the world. I'm asking you to just start a conversation. That's all. That's why we start off by saying, know your story. Understand your walk with God. Understand what brought you to faith. Tell that story. You know that story better than anybody else. And you can listen. We got some awesome stories. You ever hear Karen Helsing tell her story about how she came to Christ? That's a conversation starter. Yes, it is. That would get people to say, well, this is what happened in my family when I grew up. Oh, really? But then what happened here? That starts a conversation. Mm -hmm. That's what you start. The world is not looking to make enemies. The world is looking for peace. Amen. Amen. And you and I are messengers of peace when we start a conversation as opposed to starting a war, starting a debate, starting a filibuster. We just want to tell our story and be prepared for people who want to tell their story. The one thing people like to talk about is themselves. Yeah, they like people like to talk about themselves. You get them going, all you gotta do is get them going on themselves and it'll be midnight before you know it. It'll be like, Whoa, look at the time. <laughs> it's time to go. So start a conversation and let people talk to themselves and, and notice the points where God played a role in their life. Bring that up to them. Notice the points in their conversation that you can uh, put God in there so that they can see your story and their story are not that much difference. Right. We have to give out a warning as well as part of our job description. 
that that danger is approaching in judgment and a judge. There is one on his way who has been appointed to judge the world. And we have to be those that, that put out a warning. Just like that house is on fire, don't go in there. We yell that out, right? When we see people in danger, don't go across that street. There's a car coming. We yell out danger, right? Because just like Jesus had compassion on the crowds, you and I should have compassion for those who continue to labor in ignorance, in opposition and disbelief where God is concerned. So we have to put out a warning. And we have to be faithful to that and announce the judgment. Don't announce doom and gloom. Just announce that there is a judgment. Equip yourself to be able to, in a loving way, present this idea that the world had a beginning and the world's going to have an end. Amen. And the end is coming. We don't know when that is, but are you prepared for it? And find the ways to, in your conversation, implement that. Acts 10 and 42 says, and he commanded us mm -hmm. to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to be what? Judge. Judge of the living and the dead. So we need to let people know we have to herald and shout out this warning that God has appointed a judge. Now there was a, time, a point in time when God didn't appoint a judge. So maybe man could have thought we got a lot of time left. Got a lot of time left with the Lord's creation. There's no judge yet. But that time has passed. Oh, yeah. And it's far behind us now. Time continues on. The judge is ready. And so the time could come at any time. So you and I have to have a sense of urgency about us where evangelism is concerned. This message needs to be preached so that people could be saved from the oncoming judgment of God. Because there's already a judge that has been appointed for this end of the world we live in. Our work also entails making disciples, teaching everyone, as many people as we can, the righteousness of God. Now that needs to start first in this household of Brookfield, the household of faith. That's right. there, there's, there's a message that brings you into the faith, and then there are messages that keep you in the faith. If you only hear the message that puts you in the faith, it will be very difficult to stay in the faith without more messages. So we have to do both. We have to preach the message that encourages people to come, and we have to preach messages that encourage people to stay, to continue to turn from their ways to God's ways. And what we do is we continue to draw the contrast. We continue to paint the difference so that people know that there's a way that God wants us to live that is well-pleasing and acceptable in his sight. So we continue teaching and baptizing new believers. Right. So we take new believers, we baptize them, and we take new believers and we teach them again. Amen? Right. So Brookville, we are to teach and baptize. Right? Teach and baptize. Right? Say it with me. Teach and baptize. That's our work. That's part of our calling. We are to teach and baptize. And when we baptize them, we do what? Teach, teach them again. Right. You see, because this walk with God is not the walk that the world espouses. This walk with God, you will not find on the Housewives of Bel Air. You will not find on the popular TV shows. This walk with God is not on the Game of Thrones. This walk with God, that's my show. <laughs> this walk with God is only found in the scriptures. You do not do this walk instinctively. You know what instinctively is? That's what just comes into your mind, right? You have this way that you think is right. Well, that's one of my favorite passages of scripture. There's a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof is death. So we have to learn the proper way to walk with God. We don't instinctively know it coming out of the womb. We don't instinctively know it because of bad things that happened in our life. We don't instinctively know it because we're church members. We don't instinctively know it because we consider ourselves a child of God. We have to be taught and taught and taught. And you will never learn enough in this lifetime to consider that you've learned enough in this lifetime to be saved. Right, right. It is a process that continues to build on us. We are not perfect, 
but our, the teaching perfects us. Yes. Is that all right? That's all right? And Jesus makes the difference. Listen to what Matthew says or records of Jesus' words. We know these very well, right? He says, go therefore and make what? Disciples of all nations. Doing what? Yes. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Now look at verse number 20. He says, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And when we do that, Jesus says what? Behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. We have to be faithful in that, saints. And, and you as a student have to be faithful to it as well. It is one of the reasons why I love going to Posh in the pulpit. I learn so much when I go there. And it is teaching that grounds my faith. It is teaching that challenges my faith. It is teaching that encourages my faith. And it allows me to continue to be perfected and to continue to grow. Amen? Amen. So we have to teach them again to observe all things. Now, because the harvest of the Lord is so great, we also have to consider ways to increase our influence, increase our capacity to operate in the field. Because we will always be the minority. The field will always be bigger than us. Amen? We, we may not think this small congregation of Brookfield, who had a recorded attendance of 65, can reach into India, but if we consider increasing our capacity, we can reach into India. That's right. And the, the little old church in Brookfield that had a recorded attendance of 65 may not be may not think that it can affect other congregations of Christ, but we have to consider our brothers and sisters in Christ who might be struggling in the faith, how we can help them to be successful in the faith. Amen? Right. We have to look at ways of expanding our mission field, mm -hmm. finding ways that you and I can be even more profitable for the cause of Christ outside of the few people that we run across. And God, who is faithful, allows that to happen. That's why we're challenged to do some of the things that we do. Because we should consider expanding the mission field that we can be effective in. That's why we do works that support works in India, Papua New Guinea, and, and all over the place. That's why uh, Keith is considering going to Belize as a, as a missionary. He's expanding his mission field. And God is the one that allows that and makes that possible to happen. Look at 2 Corinthians 10, verses 15 and 16. The Bible says, We do not boast beyond limit in the labors of others, but our hope is that as your faith increases, our area of influence among you may be greatly enlarged so that we may preach the gospel, what? In lands beyond you. That's what happens when you open yourself to the possibility of a larger capacity of preaching and teaching the word of God. That's why I did my best to be of help to the church in word. That's expanding the mission field. And any other church that is, might be struggling and is asking for help or asking for counseling or asking for guidance, all of that allows us to have mission fields greater than the ones that we touch. Amen. The better help we are to a congregation like Worth, the greater the body of Christ's influence is to the world. Because we have duplicated the things that we are doing for Christ, we have duplicated that capacity in other places which then duplicates its capacity in other places. So you and I have to stop being so short-sighted to the capabilities that the little old 65 of us have where the word of God is concerned. This is a powerful word of God. That when it is preached without addition and subtraction can travel the globe at light speed and it can return back to the Father without void and it will accomplish exactly what his goal was for putting it out in the first place. But how shall they hear if they're not sent? And how shall they believe unless they've not heard? Pray that God will send laborers into this mission field that you and I 
are faithful in considering yeah. increasing the capacity of our influence over the world. Amen. And now is not the time to back up. Mm -hmm. The world does not have us on our heels. Mm -hmm. They're playing possum, yeah. and they don't know it. Mm -hmm. they're, they're running out of excuses. Matter of fact, we said this morning that the, 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 the overwhelming uh, opposing force to the truth that we preach is ridicule and shame. They want to make you feel bad for believing that a man can walk on water. They want to make you bad for believing that the dead can be raised. They want to make you bad for believing that one man could uh, take away the sins of the world. Well, don't be ashamed of what God has written. And don't be ashamed of what your Savior has achieved. It saved you and it has the power to save them. And as they hear that word, they only have two choices. They're either going to believe and obey, or they are going to oppose and not obey. That's right. Those are the only two choices they got. That's right. Now you and I got two choices. We're either going to be faithful and go out and preach this word, or we're going to keep it to ourselves. Mm -hmm. We're either going to take the easy route and be lazy workers in the vineyard. You know how some people, they can hide in the corner? You don't see them to the end of the day. And they punch out when you punch out. <laughs> They're like, where you been all day? Oh, I've been here and I've been there. Doing this, that, and the other. Like, How come you didn't get dirty? I'm dirty. <laughs> don't be that kind of work. Let's put our hands to this plow. God has already prepared a field for us to work in. It's ripe for the harvest. Now's our time. Not so many other times. Can I throw in a couple of uh, uh, things at this point? This is our last objective as far as the work that we're called to do. We have to strengthen one another. Amen. Right. We have to strengthen one another. One of the, one of the reasons I rejoice that, that, that Keith has decided to, to bring his family here to Brookfield is because now there's some more iron to sharpen iron. Right. Yeah. Now I can be even more challenged. That's right. When I get up here and preach these messages. Because I know Keith's going to get up here and preach a good message. Oh, yeah. Brother yeah. Johnson want to keep his job. He better preach a good message, too. Right. Right. He's changing jobs. Also. And that's all right if that happens. I'm not scared of that. I'm, 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 I'm ready for, for the capacity of my mission to change. I'm, I'm ready for that whenever it comes. That's right. Because yeah. the goal is not Barry, the goal is Jesus. Yeah. And as long as he is preached, we're victorious. Yeah, right. And all of us win. But we have to be in the business of strengthening one another. Because that's what it's going to take in this mission field. We're going to have to, in Acts chapter 18 and verse 23, we need to consider this. After spending some time there, because this is what Paul did. Paul and Barnabas, Paul and Silas. You know, everywhere Paul went, he preached. Guess what he did? He went back to that place that he preached and he preached again. He preached again. He made sure that the preacher that he had before, he went and straight came back and he strengthened them brothers again. And he kept preaching upon preaching, teaching upon preaching. He said after spending some time there, he departed and went from one place to the next through the region of Galatia and Phrygia, strengthening all the disciples. These are people that have already been baptized. Mm -hmm. And, and, and we know Paul was a great missionary, amen? Yes, he but he was also an awesome teacher. Yes. Because he went back and he strengthened all the disciples. Amen. That's part of our job as well, too. Yes. We need to consider that. And we need to be creative in that. We need to consider uh, perhaps some of our young men who are not finding <coughs> success in the world. Mm -hmm. Maybe they should consider the ministry. All right. And maybe they find some success in that. Yes, sir. Maybe we could be a church that can support those who are not finding ways to support themselves in the world. Maybe they can find support in the word of yeah. God. Yeah. Boy, that would turn some things around. Amen? Oh, we need to start considering ways to change our influence and our capacity to increase the mission field. Things that sound like they don't make sense right now, that they might be a little more challenging, things that we bring up excuses for, we don't have enough money, we don't have enough time, we don't have enough people. Well, guess what? When you come to God with not enough time, not enough money, and not enough people, you're in place for a miracle. 
Yeah. You're in a place for God to do what God does. And not in a place where, where men do what men do. We, we always want to do what men do. Let's start doing the things that God does. Let's start walking with him who calls things as they're not as if they were. Right. Let's let him start changing some lives of people who are down and out and start allowing them to be added in and up. Let's start right. doing those things that allow us to be ambassadors of Christ and faithful stewards of God's word so that those who are unbelieving today will become believers tomorrow. And it starts with you and I. You are the answer to a prayer. A prayer of labor and work that God has put on the heart of all of those that love his being and wait for his coming. Pray that the Lord of the harvest would send in more workers into the vineyard. Oh, this list is just too small. When you become a laborer in the field, didn't have time to check this. The Bible calls you an ambassador for Christ. When you become a laborer in the field, you become an evangelist. You become a fisher of men. Yeah. You become a messenger of the church. Uh -huh. You become a minister of God, a minister of the gospel, a minister of righteousness. You become a preacher, a servant of God, a soldier of Christ. You become a stock, a living stone, a steward of the grace of God, a steward of the mysteries of God. You become a teacher. You become a watchman. You become a witness. Yeah. You become a worker for all of those who have put their hands to the plow to achieve the very word of God that has more power in it Amen. than anything that you and I deal with today. Amen. Are you willing to be faithful to him? Are you here this morning? And do you understand that Jesus Christ is the reason for our preaching? He came into this world of sin and sorrow and he offered himself as a sacrifice for you and I. He went to Calvary's cross and died on a tree. And on that tree that usually stood for a curse of men, the curse was removed yeah. from men mm -hmm. by those who would believe in that death on that cross because Jesus was buried in a borrowed tomb and on the third day he rose again mm -hmm. in fulfillment of the scriptures and to life everlasting. Jesus will never die again. Right. Right. And for those who believe in him will never die again <coughs> as well. You and I need to accept and need to learn how to extend God's salvation invitation. Because the, labor, the, the harvest is ready. Yeah. God's put a contrast out there for some people and you and I need to come along and tell people that in order to come to Christ, you need to hear God's word and believe it. When you believe God's word, something's going to happen. You're going to be ready to act. You're going to be ready to obey based on what you have heard from God's word. What are the actions that come after belief? It is to confess before men that Jesus Christ is God's son. Amen. What is the action that comes after belief? It is to repent, to turn your life around. Stop living as one in the world and start living as one in the church. Amen. The action that comes after belief is to be baptized for the remission of your sins. Not because men said so, but because Jesus said so. Amen. What is the action that comes after belief? To remain steadfast, faithful, and unmovable until the day that you die. What's the scripture? And the lesson is yours. Matthew 7 and 24 says, Everyone then who what church? Hears, hears these words of mine. And what? Does, Does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. Where belief is concerned, John 1 and 12 says, but to all who did receive him, who what? Believe in his name. He gave the right to become the children of God. You get the right to become because your belief alone does not save you. Satan believes and is not saved. So something is required of believers and that something is to confess that Jesus Christ is God's son. No one who denies the son has the father. Whoever what? Confesses the son has the father also. We have to turn our lives around from the past. The past ways of this world. 
and start living in the light as he is in the light. Because Jesus says that unless you repent, you are all likewise perish. That's more doing. That's more action. Galatians 3.27 lets us know that baptism is putting on Christ. Paul wrote to the church in Galatia, for as many of you as were baptized yeah. into Christ have done what? Put on Christ. on Christ. He was talking to those who already heard, believed, and obeyed. Mm -hmm. Then we have to remain faithful. James, in his simple way, his straightforward epistle, he tells us, for you know that the testing of your faith produces what church? Steadfastness. The ridicule, the shame, the laughing at you produces faithfulness. But you see, if you don't put yourself out there, you don't get the ridicule. You don't get the ridicule. You don't get the ridicule. You don't get the steadfastness as well. Put yourself out there and be faithful to what we have been called for, so that men have their opportunity.